Hey everybody, welcome to Write On, the podcast from Final Draft. We are here to talk about all things screenwriting. I'm your host, Phil Galasso. Today we have a chat with fellowship and mentorship coach, Carol Kirshner. Stepping in as host today is Big Break Contest director, Kayla Guess. Kayla and Carol discussed Carol's four pillars of success, the importance of networking, how to build out your portfolio, and more. Check it out. All right, Carol Kirshner, welcome back to Ride On. How have you been since we last spoke? I have been great, although I'm sort of embarrassed to say that because it's been such a crazy time, but... Yeah. I've been very fortunate and and I'm doing really well. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Of course. I, I feel the same way. I think it's really important to just like find that gratitude and actually feel it and appreciate it for every single little thing, even these ups and downs of like opening up and closing back down and opening right. up. And so, yeah, good on you for staying positive and grateful, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Grateful all the time, all the time. I have, I, I like to say I'm the luckiest woman in show business. I truly am because I don't have to sell anything. Yeah. People return my calls, not because of who I am, but because of the programs I'm involved with. And I just help people. So it doesn't get better than that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm of the same thought process, right? Like I just love doing and giving for other people and it fulfills me just probably more than, you know, whatever the get is or, you know, the introduction or whatever the thing is and, and more good stuff keeps happening. So I'm like, let's just keep it up. Right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And that's the philosophy for today. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so last time we spoke, we were talking about fellowship season. Everyone was getting their applications in. I believe we're almost at the end of that, right? The Blacklist Lab, I think it's tomorrow. And there's a couple of others that are still open. So, uh, but are folks seeing results back yet for like first round or second round? Do we know? Well, I can only really talk about my program, CBS, Mm -hmm. and we're in the process of doing the reading now. We, we, we give the way it works if people are interested is we had like 1600, 1700 applications and submissions. So we have people do a first read mm-hmm. and then a second read. And if those two scores are high or if one is high, one is low, then we do a third read. And then after all of that is done, then it comes to me and my colleague, Jeannie Mao. Got it. So Got I'm it. in the process of reading a lot of scripts right now. I feel you, sister. (laughs) (laughs) And the the surprising thing this year is there's so many comedy writers. Are you finding that? Wow. You know, I haven't actually looked at the stats of what genre is heavy this year because I'm just blown away at the volume that we're receiving for a big break myself. Yours is much more, uh, you know, concentrated of a program. But, you know, so, so something that we both have in common is that we have contestants applicants who have a long waiting period. Yes, it's very frustrating. Yeah. And I think that's a good segue into what we want to talk about now. This is something they can distract themselves with and be working on for their own brand, for their own career. So you talk about uh, something called the four pillars of success. What is that, first of all? Sure. Well, Throughout my career, I've been really fortunate to work with some very successful people. And I was always curious about what separated the successful people from the people that gave up and went back to Ohio and sold insurance. And so I studied the successful people and I thought, what do they have in common? And I came up with four things and I call them the four pillars of success. And what they are is these people that are successful has blazing hot material regardless of whether it's a script or their directors and it's their real, what they've shot, it, it's blazing hot. It's not just kind of good. It's really good. They have a smart self-marketing strategy. And I can go into that a little bit more. They know how to talk about themselves in a way that gets people intrigued and leaning forward and wanting to know more and wanting to work with them or hire them or help them. Then the third thing is they all had, well, not every single one of them, but most of them had a comprehensive and ever-growing community of mutually beneficial relationships. They had contacts. And then the fourth is they were industry savvy. They didn't have to know about the whole industry, but they were clear about their part of the business. 
And that's what I work with my clients on is all four of those things. What response do you get from your clients when you break all that down initially? Is it Does it feel overwhelming to them before you explain each thing in detail? Or are they welcoming to this strategy? How interesting. I never actually thought about it like that. But yeah. if I think about it, I think that for most of them, it's very comforting to know, okay, here's the four things I need to do. Mm-hmm. If I do this, then the chances of my success are much higher. And it's it's very compartmentalized and actionable. Yeah. And, and I think that they respond to it. I mean, yeah, they do. I mean, people stay with coaching. So <laughs> yeah, like it, when I, I guess what I'm getting to is it seems to me when the overall industry and breaking in and that whole conversation seems very un attainable for most people. But when you break it down to these four bites of what you need to do, I feel like for me, that would really help me feel like a lot less like I'm driving blind, you know? Yes, yes, yes. It's it's concrete Mm -hmm. and it's specific. And I think that people, I mean, when I work with, I work with all levels of people in my private coaching, but the people that are just starting out, they just go, I don't know any, I don't know how to do it. Just tell me how to do it. And these are sort of the four things you need to be in place as you move forward in order to break through. And it's also too, um, I'm totally just adding on to this. We can put it in your uh, pitch. <laughs> Looking at each one of these, they're always there's always something to do within the four pillars, right? So if you're stuck on your script, go look at your four pillars maybe and see what have I done to market myself? What have I done to grow my community and so on and so forth. So I feel like it's probably a good way to make writers feel like they don't always have to be writing in their script to be working on their career, so to speak. Actually, writing is only part of your career. Mm -hmm. Knowing the business, the business is equally as important. As you said, marketing yourself equally as important. In fact, what I do with a lot of my clients, the ones that are stuck, is that I give them a specific time frame that they can work in, no more than that. Okay. But in, in any of those time frames, a certain amount is for writing and the rest is for getting knowledge and reaching out to people and expanding their contacts and figuring out how to talk about them. So those things are equally important because you may have a great project, but that's really just the beginning because people have to know you. They have to want to work with you. You have to, you have to be smart about it. The people that succeed are really smart about these things. Yeah. And put time into it. And when you, when you, I'm imagining people listening to this for the first, you know, listening to us speak and they've just decided they want to be a screenwriter and they, you know, are, were under the impression that all they had to do is focus on their voice, focus on your voice, you know, get their script done. And now to hear all of this, you know, all these other pieces that are equally important. I, I feel like a lot of people might be surprised by that. Right. Cause you <laughs> I think like so. don't talk about it enough. I, I, that's absolutely true because the way I look at it is people feel like if they just write that fabulous script, it's their Mm -hmm. golden ticket and they don't have to do anything else. Just figure out how to get it out there and everything's going to work. But the truth is that's really just the beginning. Mm -hmm. You, because I know people who have written really good scripts, but they didn't know these other things. And after that script, it went nowhere. Yeah, because it, be- it can become intimidating and there's so much on the line. It's easier to just say, fuck it. I, I can't handle all of this. I thought it was just about my writing. This isn't what I want to do. But you you break it down in simple bites for them. So let's let's go through each of them, spend a little time on each of them and kind of break down what it means and you know how our listeners can apply it to you know their own career. Sure. Sure. So the first one we have is the blazing hot material. What does that mean? Okay. So over my many years of working in television, I have read literally thousands of scripts as as you have. I've read thousands of scripts Yeah. and in any pool, and you tell me if this has been your experience in any, if you, you take a pool of scripts, five to 10% of them are so bad that your dentist would say this sucks. Anybody would read it and go, oh my God, this, no. Yeah. 
three to 5% are so sort of heartbreakingly fabulous. They're so wonderful that anyone would be able to read it and be moved and go, wow, this is great. Mm -hmm. The rest of them are somewhere between good to very good. And in order to succeed, they have to be blazing hot in order to break through. And what I feel, again, television is my area, is that if you're starting out, what you need in your portfolio, should we talk about that? Yeah, sure. Okay, so I think you need two pilot scripts. One has to be, in my opinion, high concept. It has to be something that people go, wow, okay, it's cheers on the moon. Don't do that one. That's a stupid one. (laughs) It's something that in, and high concept is that in one sentence, in that log line, you get immediately what the story is and it appeals to a wide audience for the most part and you're dying to know more. Mm -hmm. So one of them, in my opinion, needs to be that and written extremely well, of course. The second one doesn't have to be high concept. It just needs to be. And also high concept isn't about just a character study. It's not about a relationship. That's not a high concept. So the second one can just be beautifully written. Because if you're trying to get representation, I'm sure many people on the podcast have said this, they read something, they go, this is great. What else do you have? Yeah. So you need something else. And then what I think, and I'm an outlier here, is that you also should have a spec script of an existing show. A lot of people say, no, 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 you don't need that. You just need a pilot. Now, here's the thing. If you want to get staffed, I know showrunners like Courtney Kemp of the Power series on Stars, who's not interested in your original idea. She could give a shit about your voice. What she wants to know is you can write in her voice. Yeah. Now, if she feels, so she only wants to read specs. If she loves a spec, she'll meet you, she hires you. And then after she gets to know you, then she's interested and invested in your original voice. There's lots of showrunners that do want to read pilots and, I also think if you're just starting out, write a spec for an existing show before you write a pilot. Yeah. Pilots are the, in my opinion, the hardest form of screenplay to possibly write. I don't mean to scare people, but... No, I agree with you. And I want to ask why you say that. Sure. Because it has to have a beginning, middle, and end. It has to introduce compelling characters in an in a unique, fresh way that gets you going, wow, I didn't see that coming. It has to, if it's a, if it's a comedy, it has to also be funny. It has to end. And if it's a drama, it has to be emotionally moving. If it's a thriller, it has to have you on the edge of your seat. It has to have a great cliffhanger in this day of binging. It has to make you want to click through. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of shit to do in one script. So yeah, I think it's incredibly challenging. You're setting up the whole series in this one episode and that could be as little as 30 minutes, right? Yeah. And to fit in. If you write a spec first, you get a sense of structure and pacing. And I think that helps you write a pilot. Yeah. Yeah. Especially for people with brains like me, like I like to just free write. I'm not a screenwriter but I do write. And the reason I think the only reason why I haven't cracked into a screenplay is because of all of the, I just even talking about all the rules and the structure and ugh, it just makes, turns me off and away. <laughs> it makes you that. nervous. I mean, it it yeah. makes you go, no, no, thank you. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Um, I know people and I've worked with people who just start by going fade in and they figure, well, I'll get there. Sure. That will not work if you are, let's say, staffed on a show, because if you're on a show, you have to break the story. You have to structure the story first. And usually people get off into the weeds when they do fade in and wherever they want to go. And I'm going to let the characters talk to me. And t- That's good once you have your structure down. Yeah. I can't encourage people enough to break the story before you write fade in yeah because then you can just plug and play right you know once you have your outline and and, yeah okay so 
So Blazing Hot Material, it stands out amongst a crowd. Um, how would you suggest making a spec Blazing Hot? Like, how do you, is that just your concept, a, a different take on the show? What would that be? Good question. I have the fa- my most favorite spec. I don't know if we ever talked about this. I've talked on other podcasts. This was three decades ago, and it was when Cheers was on the air. And the fellow that wrote this was living in the Midwest. He was an advertising copywriter. This this got him broken in. This got him staffed on Murphy Brown, and he ultimately became a showrunner. Mm -hmm. So here's what it was. It's Cheers, and this was really true. The Pope had, at that time, the then Pope had come to the U.S. and traveled around many cities. Mm -hmm. So the story was that the Pope comes to Boston, and as a Pope mobile is going by cheers, he needs to use a bathroom. So he goes into the bar, he goes to the bathroom, he leaves the bar. Oh, and this was called the shrine. That was the title of the spec. <laughs> That's um, great. And so after he leaves, what happens is that somebody steals the toilet. It's hilarious, right? The concept is funny. And what the, what the spec did is it let us look into each of the characters and find out more about their thoughts on spirituality and religion. So it was funny and it was deep and it was within keeping of reality of the show and that world. It, it was one of the best specs I read. Yeah. So yeah. don't, here's some do's and don'ts. Don't use an external character to drive the action. That there's number one on the call sheet and number one on the call sheet is number one on the call. So better call. So there's a reason because those stars need to be in it significantly. You yeah. can use an outside character as a catalyst, as an inciting incident, but it really needs to study the, the regulars. And also, I wouldn't write the whole script around a very minor character. You can include a minor character and give them a little more love, but I wouldn't make the whole thing about them. Right. Because you're deviating too far from the actual show that people want to tune into. Exactly. You found a way to teach the audience something new that's never been explored within the context of that show. Yeah. Characters. Any way you can deepen who those characters are in Mm -hmm. your spec is a great idea. Yeah, because people love your characters and they want to know as much, be as intimate with them as they possibly can. And so that's genius. That's a great tip. Yeah. And going back to Blazing Hot, people say, well, how do you know if it's Blazing Hot? Well, your phone is ringing. People back in the day, they want to take you. And in the future, they want to take you to lunch. They want to take you to dinner. They want to buy you drinks. They want to invite you to a barbecue. They want you to come in because they want to buy your project or they love your writing and they want you, they want to hear what else you have, or they want to pitch you ideas. You're busy. That's how you know it's blazing hot. And also what I say is, you know, if your script has been out there three, four months and nothing is happening, it's not the world. It's that the script isn't ready And, and go back in and really make it blazing hot. Yeah. Great. That's, that's super helpful for even for me who doesn't write screen. Like I, I honestly didn't know the answer to that question. I just ask what I want to know people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and can I, can I do a shout out for one of the best books on the topic of writing a pilot? Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you know Cam Miller's book, The Hero Succeeds? No. It is the best. And I've read many books on this subject. She has sold a number of pilots and she was a professor at USC. So she in screenwriting. So she understands what it takes and how to teach it. And I think it's called the hero succeeds, how to create a character driven television series. Awesome. Okay. Well, I want to check that one out myself as well. Yeah. Okay. So let's move on to uh, number two of your pillars, smart self-marketing strategy. So that implies that there is a dumb (laughs) (laughs) self-marketing. That's how my brain works, people. I love that. I love it. There is a dumb one. It's to not do anything at all. Yeah. It's it's to just talk about yourself all the time. And and, 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 uh, and I'll just, I'll put this in there too. Uh, Negative and the complaining. Like I see a lot of writers online 
almost like backhanded compliments, even like congratulating someone when they're tweeting about getting into their first writer's room, but it's like, congratulations. I can't even get a meeting. Like, you know, (laughs) don't be that guy. No one wants that. And, you know, there are creators and showrunners and producers and agents and managers online and they see that shit and they're like, oh, I don't want to work on that person. (laughs) No, 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 no. I mean, positive energy is super important. It's infectious. It makes people want to be around you and work with you, right? Absolutely. It's like anything in life. You know what I mean? You want to be around, most people want to be around positive, upbeat people. I'll tell you, the people that go back to Ohio, their circle of friends are all bitter and discouraged and they, they, they have given up themselves. So surround mm-hmm. yourself with yeah. people who are upbeat. But mm-hmm. in terms of having a dumb self-marketing strategy, that would be to say, I'm not very good or... You know, I've been out of the penitentiary for a while now, but I don't think I'm going back. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, the self-deprecating. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's emotionally exhausting for people to be around too. So what's the smart self-marketing strategy? Okay. So when I say self-marketing strategy, what I really mean is what is your entertainment industry brand? I hate the word brand because it's so corporate. But it is correct because what it means is it's what people think of you, the image they have of you when your name comes up because they've worked with you or they know you or they've heard about you. It's how people perceive you. Mm -hmm. And perception is almost everything. So Mm -hmm. that's what it is. And I think it's made up of three things. As you can tell, I love lists. I'm a list. So here's the three things your personal log line. And what that is, is it answers the question, what do you do? And in Hollywood, as you know, everybody wants to know what you do, but they really want to know is what you can do for them. But at first they ask you, what do you do? Yeah, that's the subtweet. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. And it's about 30 seconds long. It really is just 30 seconds long. And then the set, and it's a conversational monologue, really. And it sort of highlights your successes and what makes you memorable. Then there's what I call your personal nuggets. And I stole that term from Glenn Mazzara, who was the showrunner on The Walking Dead. And he is the golden nugget. He's so wonderful. He does he so much for others. Oh, my God. He is the most giving writer I know. Yeah. He has helped so many writers. He's, oh. he's just the best. The nuggets are the anecdotes, the stories of your life. They are what makes you memorable. They are why if I meet with six people when I'm interviewing for my CBS program, it's the ones that stick out at the end of the day, the end of the week that I remember. It's super important. And the third is your, what I call your personal A story. And what that, it's an A story. It's a chronological narrative of your life with you as a protagonist It emphasizes and highlights your successes, what makes you memorable. And importantly, the narrative drive is where you started, what you had to overcome to get to where you are, and where you want to go. And has a very satisfying sort of conclusion to that narrative drive. And that should be about a minute to a minute and a half long. And that answers the question that everybody's going to hear, which is, so tell me about yourself. You, I don't care where you are in your career, people are going to say that. And your personal A story is the answer to that question. Yeah. And it's not an opportunity to you know, cite every terrible thing you've ever gone through and have had to overcome. And this is why you deserve this shot. It's more of I mean, with the executives that I speak with, and when I say executives, I'm talking about producers, agents, managers, I just hate the word gatekeeper. So when I'm speaking with them, you know, the the common thread that they're always looking for in new writers is what is their brand? How can I sell them? How do I pitch them? And so if you have that done and ready to go, you're this potential, you know, partnership that you're that you're obviously after whether it's the producer or the manager or what have you that is a huge huge signal that you're someone that they should partner with and and invest in because you're already investing in yourself and knowing that 
Absolutely. You know? It's the truth is that when an agent or manager calls somebody to set up a meeting for you, yeah. they have about three or four sentences to say who you are. Yeah. Now, when you meet with potential reps, if you can give them that information, as you said, if you can give them what that story is, they don't have to work as hard. They'll get it in a minute and they'll decide whether they think they can sell that. And if it's a compelling brand, they can definitely sell it. Yeah. If the material's good. Yeah. And do you think that personal narrative should definitely tie into their, I guess their genre, their format, their, that, like you said earlier, like their corner of the industry, it should talk about that a bit too. I think that it should be included, but it shouldn't be all about it. Usually I have people sort of say it towards the end. Mm -hmm. You know, I write grounded sci-fi and it's chronological, as I said, it's, but you don't want to spend too much time saying, I grew up in Boise, Idaho. It was a small town. What you want to emphasize is how your, your narrative drive is how you became a writer and why that's exciting for you. And when I say, I'm, I'm just piggybacking what you said, is you don't want to talk about something horrible that happened to you that's so personal that you're still having trauma with. That's not a good idea because you don't want to stop people as they're listening to you to feel terrible for you, to feel sorry for you. Yeah. If it's something you've totally dealt with and you can kind of toss it off, mm -hmm. then you can include it. Otherwise, make it less personal. Yeah, that's my opinion. Like you're a comedy writer. And you should be funny if you're a com, but don't try too hard. That one time when I got ran over by a car. <laughs> That's right. Well, I limped away and it was, you know, I have people, yeah, I don't have to go into a whole lot of detail, yeah. but yeah. the truth is if you're a comedy writer without trying to do set up, set up joke in that conversation, mm -hmm. just be amusing. Yeah. I would even say, I think uh, a good place to do that kind of homework too, is go watch comedy specials on Netflix. That's really what they're doing. They're talking about themselves, their experiences. Obviously things are embellished, but a great comedian is just telling a story or, you know, they're like the critical thinking that they've gone through and they're lacing it with their personal stuff with jokes. And that's what makes it great. It's not set up, set up punchline. Like you said, that is um, great. I I'm going to steal that from you and give you no credit for that one. Just so oh, you know. Yeah. I, I love, I live for a new comedy special. They come out and that's what we're doing tonight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it's also interesting just to like, see how other people's brains work. Like the critical thinking I could talk about like Dave Chappelle, how he, his comedy for hours, because it's just, if you think about it, like all of his specials are just about some thought process. He went down a rabbit hole on one night when he was stoned. Right. <laughs> But it's like interesting concepts. So it uh, is, but you don't in your personal A story, you don't want to go too deep down that hole. You know what I mean? You want yeah. you want to know when you go in to have a meeting what you are going to say. Mm -hmm. And you want to make sure that you hit all the points you want to make. And hit, here's a tip that I give people: write it out first, word for word. Mm -hmm. then convert it into bullet points and practice using the bullet points because then it gives it more room to breathe and it doesn't sound like it's absolutely memorized all the time. Yeah. Um, I have a mentee who he knows how to pause. He said the same thing for the 14 weeks he was in my program and he go, I guess you could say that I grew up in two worlds. And I really did. I mean, and each time it sounds fresh and he does a little laugh, but yeah. uh, I would practice it to, to your friends if they're nice people, but ask them honestly to say, what made you lean forward and where did you lose interest? I would hone it. This is as important as your script. Yeah. It really is. And put the same amount of work into it and time it. I've had people come into CBS and they were just they were flat footed. They couldn't read the room and they talked and talked and talked. We'd say, tell us about yourself. And five minutes later, they're still talking. They didn't stop to take a breath to ask us a question or to let us ask them a question. So right. don't do that. And if you practice, you won't. So don't suck the oxygen out of the room, people. <laughs> yeah, please don't do that because uh -huh. our eyes roll over, our eyes roll up and 
it's a nightmare to have to <laughs> listen. Yeah, to yeah. I, and you know, listen, these people are taking meetings every day, several a day, and it's it's not easy to stand out. So you want to stand out for good reasons, not for bad, for being exactly. <laughs> For being somebody who talked at you the whole time. Yeah, yeah. Just rolling on over you with your words. It's like a date. Let me just say, it's like a date where you've had, we've all had, and I I assume most of us had, terrible dates where somebody just talked at you the whole time and you thought, get me a hell out of here. Yeah. And then there's people who are engaging and charming and it's a conversation back and forth. That's what it really is. Yeah. Yeah. When every like anecdote you add, they turn it back towards about them and how they, yeah. <laughs> listen, I can talk shit about that because I've been that guy. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh yeah. When I was younger. Oh hell yeah. I did. I, I needed a lot of attention when I, well, I guess I still do, but not in that way. <laughs> so. <laughs> and I was so codependent that I just kept asking questions yeah. and people would, I'd ask questions. If there was a pause, I'd ask more questions, ask more questions. They would talk the whole time. And then I'd say, geez, they talk the whole time, even though I totally set them up for that. Yeah. Yeah. Put yourself in that position. So let's talk about the the third pillar, which is a com- building a comprehensive community and of contacts. And you add uh, that of mutually beneficial relationships. So oh, that's break critically down important. the first part of that, a comprehensive community of contacts. What do you mean by that? I mean that you know a lot of people and you are interacting with these people on a regular basis. I really encourage people to use a a spreadsheet, uh, what I call a networking template. And if anybody wants one, I have a great one and they can just email me at carol at carolkirshner.com and say, can I have that networking template? And I'll send it to them. Because throughout your career, you're gonna meet a lot of people and you're gonna forget where did I meet them? What's their daughter's name? What script of mine did they read? What, when was the meeting? So it's really important to keep that really up to date. It, it's a, the people that are successful do that. Mm-hmm. They don't just go, oh, I know, I, I think I know people. And they are not constantly, but consistently meeting more people. Uh, Sometimes it's on the work that they're doing and they're meeting more people and they stay in touch with them. And sometimes it's because they are reaching out to people in a proactive way. And by mutually beneficial, what I mean is you're not taking. Everybody hates that. I hate that. I'm sure you hate that, right? Mm -hmm. You can tell a taker. Yes. (laughs) So don't be that guy. How are you doing? Here's what I need. (laughs) That's right. Hi, can you help me? (laughs) Um, no, they don't even say you can, and, and, and there's a sense of entitlement when they do it. And it's like, and and I have to tell you, this is just an aside on my website and on my social media, I have people who reach out to me and say, we read my script and I have to say, I don't know you. Yeah. My life is really busy. Why? I don't know you. Why would I spend an hour to two hours of my time reading your scripts when we don't have a relationship? And, and I did a blog about Hollywood etiquette. And that is like the number one, don't do that. Don't ask anybody to read your script until you have a relationship with them. Ever. So that's just my pet peeve. Ever. Not in person, not online. Do not attach it to an email. Do not, do not, do not. <laughs> not. Do not do that. And, and then get pissed off that they said no. Yeah. Don't do that. Um, yeah, but anyway, Twitter and, and talk about elitism and, and what have you. And it's like, really, you're in the wrong, though. Nobody owes you shit. They don't owe you anything. Here's what's also true, though, that everybody, almost everybody is happy to find the person who if they recommend them, it will make them look good. People, everybody got helped. And if they have a relationship with you and they ultimately do read your material and they think it's amazing. It makes them look good to reach out to somebody that says, I just met somebody who is incredible. You Mm -hmm. should meet this person. Not everybody will do it, but a whole lot of people will do that. Yeah. That's a big part of my job and I love it. (laughs) That is your job. That's exactly your job. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, I mean, I can't, 
yeah, I don't even know the word for it. It's just so exciting to like, I already have a, a script so far this season that a reader put in front of me and was like, this is the best script I've read through all seasons. And so I'm reading it right now with a fine tooth comb and I can't wait to like, see if my opinion matches. And if so, like just that excitement of saying, you know, to all the people that have been supporting our contest, like you've got to read this, you've got to read this, you know? So yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. When you say, I guess when people think of building their community, I'm going to assume because I've heard this, but uh, there's definitely people listening who think they just need to meet writers. And what do you say about that? I say that's, that's not at all the case. And and let me just go back for one second to what we were talking about and like how excited you are to tell people about this amazing writer for all of us who will recommend people we also have one shot. We're not going to burn our relationship by saying this guy, he, he, not guy, but here's a writer who's pretty good yeah. because they will stop reading the people that you recommend. But if you mm-hmm. recommend somebody that blows their socks off, as a matter of fact, Stephen Falk, who was the creator of uh, You're the Worst, and he several years ago said, do you know anybody I'm hiring? Do you know anybody? And I sent him a woman who was in the CBS program who was, she was killer, man. She was amazing. He hired her and she now has an overall deal at FX. She's amazing. She's only been in the business like six years as a writer, maybe five years. But anyway, so he, then he comes back to me and says, you were so right with April do you have anybody else? So you want to be that person that people say you did such a great, you had such a great eye. Do you know anyone else? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, that was like one of the key things that I was trained on when I took over as the contest director was don't burn your reads, make sure you love it too. Just because a reader says they loved it, you know, all, all that stuff is subjective, right? You know, yeah, just don't burn your reads, whether you're the person sharing other writers or you are the writer, you know, make sure your ask it like makes sense. And there's actually a path forward instead of just getting like a pat on the back or a like on Twitter about it, you know? Yeah. Um, I think we get, because it's such a marathon of a career, you know, I think people just need some sort of boost, you know? And so, <laughs> but, and they'll send out like uh, too early of a draft. You Don't know? do that. Do not do that. Yeah. Don't do that because, and I just had a client send me an email asking, he said, if I sent a script to a manager and he didn't like it, how long until I can send them another script? You cannot send them another script. No. You may not because no. they won't read it. No. So don't <laughs> send out something that isn't ready. And, and that means that it's been vetted by a number of people and the reaction of everybody is, wow, this is great. This is what I call industry ready, ready to go. Yeah. Yeah. And you can do that if you have a comprehensive community of people that will read it for you. And that's where the mutually beneficial relationships come in. Mm -hmm. You, You read something of theirs. They read something of yours. They need help uh, with making their web series. You go hold the boom. They give you they they give you a tip about a contest or about something that they heard about. That it's back and forth. It's really back and forth. And you said, do people need to just know writers? No, they, it's really important to know writers. And a lot of people feel I should only know somebody at the highest level. <laughs> Not true. Yeah, and. It makes you look bad to feel, and and people get in their mind this idea that only one person is going to make or break their career, and if they they've got to get to that person, you're you're starting out in the business, you are growing up with a group of people. They're in kindergarten with you, and then they're going to go through elementary school with you, and then they're going to go through middle school and high school and college. Start these relationships early. And they're going to end up being people who hire you or that you work with, or they recommend you. And as everybody moves up, they bring each other up. And I think it's great to know assistants. If you're just starting out, those are wonderful people to know. And actors are great to know. And, and anybody who's working the business is great to know. Mm -hmm. And you should also have a full life and not just know people in the business. Yeah. 
That's true too. You do have to, to live a life to know how to write, right? Exactly. <laughs> to have something to write about or a perspective at least, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Oh man. Yeah. And you know, like I think uh, another point that you've made before another time that we've talked and I've kept it in my, you know, arsenal of, you know, tools that I share with people, which is you're, what you're basically asking people to do to hire you is risking a lot of money. There's a lot on the line, millions of dollars. Would you trust some stranger because they emailed you with a script? No. If you sell your pilot and your room has to get staffed, you're maybe you're not show running, but you're part of the staffing, right? Who are you going to bring with you? People you know, people you trust, people you know give a shit about your work, you know, and the integrity of your project. Yep. Yep. And it's a risk adverse business all in all. It's risk adverse. So if somebody knows somebody and has worked with them or knows somebody who is, knows somebody who re- recommends them highly, it is less of a risk to hire them Mm -hmm. than it is to hire somebody they don't know at all. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Doesn't mean it shouldn't happen, but that's just human nature. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Of course. So our next, our last pillar of success is industry savvy. Yeah. So let's talk about what that means industry wide. You know, let's talk about what does it mean to just be savvy in general? How can one be? Yes, good question. What it really means is that you are aware of what's going on in the business. You're part of the business. And there's two ways to look at it. One is you're really clear about your part of the business, who the players are, what the trends are, what's getting bought, what's getting made, who is an up and comer, who's leaving their job, who's starting their job. And then there's sort of having an a perspective on the industry as a whole. People are interested in other people's, especially writers' perspective on the business and what's happening. Don't have a knee jerk, oh, it's terrible. Really think things through and have a thoughtful commentary on what you think is going on and what it means. And people will want to engage with you about that conversation, but you can't talk about it if you don't know what's happening. Yeah. And you can't learn if you don't have an opinion, you know, it's like, obviously it's an opinion. So, you know, no one's not, you're not going to be right all the time. And you, you learn from other people, but if you don't have a stance, you can't even engage in a conversation to learn anything. It is true. One of the most successful writer, producers, directors is John Wells. He did ER, West Wing, Shameless, everything. Yeah. He is so knowledgeable about all parts of the business, about the financial parts of the business, about the technical parts of the business. You can see why he is successful, why he has an empire, because he knows all of that. You don't have to have an empire, but start educating yourself absolutely. And what are ways that folks can do that? Yeah, good question. Read the trades. I'm a big deadline fan, but you can read Deadline. You can read The Wrap. You can read Hollywood Reporter. You can read Variety. There's podcasts. There's so many podcasts. There's blogs that people write. All the information, and I like to say this, because of the World Wide Web, uh, you can find out anything. And you can stay current and find people that you're interested in following. You like their perspective and see what they have to say. And then you can form your own opinions about it. And and watching is as important as reading and as writing, right? In terms of TV, there's so much television out there. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Somebody came in to meet with my colleague at CBS and uh, first he put his feet up on the coffee table. Oh. That's a no-no. Oh, hello, sir. And, <laughs> and he's a playwright. And then she said, so what are you watching? He said, oh, I don't watch television. And he was there to get hired as a television writer. Well, mm-hmm. that didn't happen. So yes, being being aware of what's going on, knowing what's hot right now. Yeah. You know, it was the Queen's Gambit. It was so many, knowing knowing what they are, you know, mayor of East Town. I, know what is happening, have an opinion, watch it, learn from it. And it, it's, they used to call it water cooler programming. Yeah. People are talking about it. You want to be part of that conversation. 
Yeah, you really do. And I feel like one of the main reasons is just to know like what's out in your in your market of your corner of the industry, but also how often when you're doing meetings for people that you're considering for any role in television, do you ask them what TV shows they love? Oh, yes. It's always going to certainly with all of the fellowships, people are going to say, what are you watching? Mm -hmm. And I always think that let's say you're coming to CBS mention one or two things on CBS, but also mention all those incredibly interesting and, and um, moody and clever shows on streamers, on cable, on premium cable, have a wide area of knowledge about them and be excited about them. I hate people that just pander to CBS when I know you're watching more than procedurals. You have to be. So... <laughs> You don't live and breathe procedurals, Carol? <laughs> yeah, it's my life, man. It's my life. The, the truth is, my husband and I are watching this show called Vera. It's a British detective show. Okay. You cannot stop watching it. It is a Vera. procedural. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. it's with Brenda Bleffin. It's really good. Exciting. I'm, uh, I'm stuck on Why Women Kill right now. Wow. On uh, All Access or Paramount Plus. Yeah, I think so. I don't know anymore. We have the Apple TV. So I'm just like, let's yeah. search the title. And I, it's genius. I, same. I can't stop watching it. It's funny. It's smart. It's dumb. It's like, uh, yeah, it's, you know, it just checks all the boxes. And, and so, yeah, just like work, like I say that to make an example, because now you're having a conversation with someone and you've taken the pressure off of like, what do they think of me? Cause you're not focused on that. You're focused on something you love. And Absolutely. what you're also demonstrating is your passion for TV, for that, you know, corner of the market that you want to be a part of. Absolutely. It, it is that. And it also shows that you have opinions about things that, you know, smart writers are really compelling and you can say smart things if you've watched it and you've digested it. And you're, as you said, it definitely shows your passion. If you say, I cannot get enough of it. Yeah. You'll understand that that you are somebody who's really invested in your career. And that's a big thing for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we got to wrap it up a little bit, but I do want to talk about, so next time we have you on, we're going to get more into detail about building your comprehensive community and networking, how you can do that in person and online. But we also want to mention you have a program coming up very soon called Get the Fuck Unstuck. So tell us a little bit about that and how people can uh, look that program up for you. Sure. With this you. is for people who, <laughs> this is for people, any creative professionals, but I have a lot of screenwriters. It's an online Zoom course. It's three Saturdays. It starts August 14th. It's from 10 to 1230 each of those days, the 14th, 21st, 28th. And this is really for people who feel stuck in their career. You know, this is for people who say, I have a great idea. And a year from now, they're still talking about it and they haven't done it. There okay. are people who said, yes, I have a great idea. This is what I want to do. And they start, but it fizzles out. So this is really, how do you get unstuck? How do you find the path forward? And it's very interactive. You won't be bored. And at the end, you'll have sort of your marching order and action plan of what to do and support to do it. Yeah. I love that you said path forward because while you were talking, that's what I was like thinking in my head. Oh, oh really? Path that's forward. What's the path forward. Yeah, exactly. So, so how can people uh, look this program up and get involved for themselves? Sure. Sure. They can go to my website, carolkirshner.com and look under classes and book, or you can go to ckgtfu.com, which is Carol Kirshner, get the fuck unstuck.com. You do with the acronyms. I like it. <laughs> yeah. G, I never get this right. G T F U. So C K for Carol <laughs> G T F U.com. Love it. Love it. All right. Well, thank you so much, Carol. In the meantime, where can people find you on social media? On Twitter, it's at Carol Kirsch. On Facebook, it's Carol. Mona Kirshner, I think. I'm not so good with social media. I'm not really so much on Instagram. On LinkedIn, it's Carol Kirshner. Okay, great. All right. So our next installment, we're going to talk more about building that comprehensive community. I look forward to talking about that and just helping, especially like right now, you know, we all thought we were going to get back to it in person. And now there's like 
a hint of us, maybe, you know, who knows what's going to happen and we might, but we might remain online for a little bit longer. Right. So I think it'll be really good to talk about it. Uh, it's a nice, well-rounded conversation. So I'll, uh, stop running my mouth, have a <laughs> great day and thank, thank you. you so much for your time and sharing your wisdom with our listeners. I, I imagine everyone found something that they, that is useful to them in this. So thank you so well, much. I hope so. And thank you so much. I love talking to you. You're so much fun to talk to. Oh, me too. Thank you. Take care. Thanks to Carol Kirshner for coming on the show and to Kayla Guest for hosting. And as always, thanks to you, our listeners. If you liked this episode, leave us a review. And if you haven't already, subscribe on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. For news about future episodes and more, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Final Draft Inc. and Instagram at Final Draft Screenwriting. This episode was produced by Kayla Guess with help from associate producer Emma Vranich. Music by T. Kelly. Thanks again, everyone. Until next time, right on. Thank you.